language to the photograph uh, that I was going to give uh, and uh, instructed the jurors that they uh, have an obligation to put aside personal feelings, quests, and we'll have to be more specific at the sidebar when I'm done. Um, and I will be giving an instruction regarding uh, Ms. Asher not testifying, which is requested. Oh, and this is the um, what, and, I, and, and the co-venture instruction will be given before I give a subject to the law. <coughs> Any specific question you have regarding the improper disposition? I don't know. Well, that's the two. That's the two. Okay. No body, no blood, no DNA, no evidence. That's how I started this case, and I suggest to you that nothing has changed, for, except for the fact that you now know exactly what it was that the New Hampshire police chose to investigate, and more importantly, chose not to investigate, and you now know what they chose not to tell you. Don't you know, after having listened to all of this evidence for the last eight days or so, that Michael Lord was never at Barbara Asher's house that day, that he certainly wasn't tied up on a rack and had an accident or a heart attack, and he surely wasn't dragged and put in that very small bathtub to be chopped up? Isn't it clear that the reason the evidence does not exist is because nothing happened on July 3rd? And isn't it abundantly clear with the evidence that does exist that Michael Lord was never, ever at Barbara Ash's house on that day? If I appear tense right now, I am. And that is because of the grave responsibility that I have in representing Barbara Ash in front of you. She has put this part of her life in my hands. It's the last time that I get a chance to speak to her, and that is something that I take very, very seriously. And I suggest, ladies and gentlemen, that when I sit down, that that responsibility passes on to you all, because it's going to be you and only you who are going to decide what happened on July 3rd. It's going to be you and only you who will decide what happens to Barbara Asher. It's a decision that you and I will never forget. And I suggest it's a decision that she is going to have to live with forever. The court has told you, and is going to tell you again, that in this case, it is the prosecution with all of its various police departments, with all of its various forensic crime labs, 
that has the burden of proof in this case. They have to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt to a moral certainty that a crime actually occurred at all. It doesn't mean maybe, probably, or possibly Michael Lord was at uh, Barbara Asher's house. The court is going to tell you. Maybe, probably, and possibly is not enough. It's a heavier burden than that. And part of what it means is that Barbara Asher is presumed to be innocent even as she sits in front of you right now. Just like you or I or any one of our loved ones in this room would be. That she has to do nothing. It's obvious that I chose not to call her to the stand to testify. The court is going to tell you that the law says that you are not to hold my decision against her in any way. You know how carefully you all were selected. You know, we, we all could agree that you were the, whichever 12 of you there will be, will be the best group of 12 bright minds, people with common sense, that can sit and decide these facts fairly. When you took an oath, you promised that you would uphold the law. And I trust that you will do that. And quite frankly, Barbara Asher has a right to trust me when I tell her that she can trust you. So what is the issue in the case? Well, most respectfully, as I said in the beginning, the issue is not whether or not anyone who knew one particular side of Michael Lord has seen him since July of 2000. The issue in the case isn't, of course, any sort of judgment or referendum on what people do in the privacy of their own homes or between consenting adults about lifestyles. The issue comes down to a single issue, but by no means a simple issue. Where did Michael Lord go? when he left his home in July of 2000. Where is the evidence to show that he was ever at Barbara Asher's house or that she ever saw him in person that day? I suggest that it doesn't exist. It is not enough for the New Hampshire police to have a theory, to have a story that they want to believe. They want to believe it so badly that they ignore all the evidence that tells them that it didn't happen. That's not enough to support a conviction for such serious charges. It's not enough that the New Hampshire police may want to bring closure to the family to support such a conviction of such serious charges. It's not even enough for detective after detective after detective to come on this witness stand and tell you that she confessed. It's not enough for the prosecutor, no matter how many times he's going to say she left him on, on this rack for 15 minutes and didn't get help. It's not enough for them just to say that if to support any sort of conviction. If that were the case, there'd be no need for you all to be here. As difficult and as noble as your job is, the law demands more. The law demands that whatever is being said from that witness stand, whatever the prosecution's theory is about what is supposed to have happened, that that be backed up by fact, by evidence. Not a theory, not a story, but hard, cold, concrete fact so that you can be sure before you have to make such an awesome decision that you can be sure beyond a reasonable doubt to a moral certainty that any crime happened at all here or that Barbara Asher ever <coughs> saw Michael Lord in person that day. Where <coughs> is the evidence? You've heard me saying this over and over and over again. Every single detective that was involved in taking this off-tape so-called confession said, we have none other than what Ms. Asher told us. We have no evidence. The court is going to tell you in some fashion um, that you, know, you, you need to have some independent corroboration to show that this is something that actually happened, not just an imaginary tale not just an imaginary story. You need to be sure that they have evidence of proof beyond a reasonable doubt that, that this is a true confession and not a false confession. Where is the evidence about that? Isn't it coincidental that Detective San Bataro just happened to ask all of the right questions with all of the right facts in his questions 
that Barbara Asher ended up supposedly confessing to? What are the chances of that happening? What are the chances of that happening? Let's look at the first phase. The New Hampshire investigation. It obviously became clear very early on that Michael Lord had a secret life. A secret life that was so hidden that his family, his close friends, his neighbors, nobody knew about his life in the S and M world. And it became very clear early on, I believe perhaps it was July 14th, when the sons started to look at what was in their father's trailer, that not only was Michael Lord living a secret life, but that it involved a secret life of S&M activity, of pornography, of sexually, graphically violent photos that I believe one of his sons described on the computer, of pornography that was on the computer that included S&M situations, dominatrix <coughs> situations. You heard them describe that, and what a shock that was to them. The police were involved the Northampton police were involved as early on as July 14th. They knew there was information, there was a computer that Mr. Lord had. And it doesn't take a police investigator, it doesn't take anyone any more knowledgeable than any of us to know that that computer was a potential source of incredible evidence if you were trying to find out something about Michael Lord's secret life, and if you were trying to find out, who in the world has he been in contact with recently? You know, what has he been doing? This is something we don't know about. And we heard question after question about what is contained <coughs> on a computer. A lot of this is within our own common knowledge. We knew he had emails. They chose, and Detective Sambataro can tell you that he's just on the computer without anyone's permission when the state police are there but they chose to copy a couple of emails from Lady Kendrick. What, were, what about the rest of the emails? What about his address book on the computer? What about trying to find out if he had had any contact or even uh, a routine type of contact with another particular dominatrix or another person that was involved in some slice of this life? Why didn't they look? It didn't take much. Remember, the state police of New Hampshire seized this computer. <coughs> they seized it for a reason. You heard Detective Moriarty say it should have been done. That would have been good police procedure. What was deleted? Did people have access to that computer between July 3rd and July 17th? We know at least Patty Randall did. We know the sons did. What was done? What was erased? What was you know, what, what did they think they were, uh, if it was Patty Randall in there? We know she had access to his email. He had a couple of different email identities. She was in and out of that house. She had a key. Patty Randall calls his sons. First time ever. Do the police have the father's phone bills? Isn't that odd? Was that ever followed up? Doesn't that strike you as a little, an odd question? The sons told the police it was odd. You know, when, what did they do in terms of the computer finding out where he had been on the internet. I mean, we all know you can find that out. And it can be as easy as just dropping down the address bar. It can be as easy as looking in the history. It can be as easy as looking at favorites. It could be a little bit more sophisticated to go to where these, these photos were, these sexually graphic photos were on the computer and track it back. Were there photos of anyone else with Michael Ward's photos on, on that computer? Had he uploaded any of his images on that computer? We don't know. Wouldn't you want to know, in a, miss, in a missing person investigation, who it was that Michael Ward had recent contact with? Is that too much to ask before they decide that they're going to charge and have, and have this case go on against Barbara Asher? Because the one thing we do know, there was nothing about Barbara Asher on that computer. We do know that. And then we know the answering machine. Patty Randall was in there listening to his messages. They seized the answering machine. They seized the caller ID. Did they do anything to try to find out?